when we see you we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us Worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, hear the sound of hearts returning to you we turn to you in your kingdom and in your kingdom broken lives are made new you make us new Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praise, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Put your hands together. I need some rhythm this morning. Here we go. There's no rock, there's no God like our God. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all I pray. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved, proving himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Sing that again, there is no rock. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved, proving himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Let's sing the verse again. There is no rock. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. Do you believe that this morning? No other name, no other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock. There is no God like us. Rock of ages. 
Jesus is the rock, rock of ages. Jesus is the rock, rock of ages. Jesus is the rock. There is no rock. There is no God like ours. There is no rock. There is no rock. There is no God like ours. Proclaim it one more time. There is no rock. There is no rock. There is no God like ours. If you believe it, give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. So thankful, so grateful to be able to worship with you this morning. It's just, it's really a joy of my heart when, you know, I, I don't necessarily like it when Shannon goes out of town, but it's such a, it's such an honor just to sing and worship with you and just to offer praise to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as I was going through this set, a lot of times as we, we want to listen to what the songwriter may have had, what kind of inspiration a songwriter may have had on a song and these two songs back to back are uh, called the same thing it is well and it is well with my soul and Horatio Spafford back in the 1870s was a successful lawyer that lived in Chicago and had a lot of holdings and a lot of property and very very successful and he was he loved Jesus as well and had five children and his son at the age of two passed away and then in the 1870 71 somewhere around there the great Chicago fire came through and, and burnt and a lot of his holdings were lost in the fire and, and a lot of devastation and yet he still was faithful to his father to his to his Jesus his Savior so he decided to take his wife and his four daughters and send them on a vacation but he had to stay back and do some some business dealings and in those days we didn't fly too much <laughs> but he took on a sailing ship and during the course of the sail the ship crashed into another ship and he lost his four daughters so he lost his son his four daughters a lot of his holdings and yet he remained faithful so his wife sent a telegraph back said survivor one which was her he got on the next ship he could and I guess while he was out at sea and about the place where he lost his daughters, he penned this song, It Is Well With My Soul. And there's another lady by the name of Christine DeMarco that also had it as well. She went through some trials and some tribulations. And I, I guess what my point to this morning is, if you're here and you've had those trials, you've had those tribulations, and you're going through rough times and you're going through difficulty, I would pray that your faith would become sight when you see Jesus working in your life and be able to be resolved in saying it as well with my soul. And just giving praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can we continue to do that this morning? And 
this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. lift up your voice. Thank you, Father. It is well with my soul. Father, we worship you. We cry out. We lift our voice to you, Father. Lord, in everything that we walk through, you are with us. Everywhere we go, you are there. 
places we've been, you brought us through. Thank you for this journey, Father God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father. What joy is found in communion with you, beholding your beauty and knowing your truth, living a life that pleases your Responding with praises to all that you are, singing, oh, how lovely is the King, in all his glory is the Christ, who is holy, who was, and who that draws us near. What joy is found at the foot of your throne, bowing in reverence, giving thanks to the one, joining the angels and the heavenly throne along with the saints an unending song singing oh how lovely is the king in all his glory is the Christ who is holy who is and how amazing is his love so unfailing is his grace that draws us near and oh how lovely is the king in all his glory Christ, who is holy, who was, and who is, and how amazing is his love, so unfailing is his grace that draws us near. I've come to worship. I've come to fall down, to seek only your face, laying down my crown. I've come to worship, I've come to fall down, seek only your face. Laying down my crown, singing, Oh, how lovely is the King in all his glory, is the Christ who is holy, who was, and who is, and how his love so unfailing is his grace that draws us near I've come to worship I've come to fall down seek only your face laying down my crown sing that again 
come to worship, lift up your voice. I've come to fall down, seek only your face, laying down my ground. Father, we thank you today for your grace and your presence in our lives. That you take care of the details. And Lord, you, you, you know our journey. You, you know where we've come from. You know where we're going. So we commend and commit our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's good to have you today. If you're our guest, we want to welcome you. We're going to just take a few moments and greet the people around you. Go ahead. Take some time and do that. Hey, good morning again. It's good to see you today. This is a, this is a great day. We have, a, we have a whole bunch of our families out at family camp, out at Metzler Park today, and they're going to be headed back in the next few hours. It is a lively crew. Uh, we were out there, Annette and I were out there Friday with five of our grandkids, and man, it just like, it's like an ant farm out there. There's just all kinds of things going on. And so it's, it really is. It's a lot of fun. So pray for them. I know they had a good time, good fellowship, as especially as they come back uh, from their trip. Hey, we're going to do this right now. For those that are our guests today, we want to thank you for hanging out with us, being with us for a little bit. We're going to receive our morning tithe and offering. Most of you know that this is kind of the end of our fiscal year. Your generosity makes all the difference in the world. And I know this about generosity. It is the primary vehicle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the greatest verses of all time is, For God so loved the world that he, he gave. He was very generous. And I'm thanking him today for his generosity in my life and what I see through the generosity that comes through your life. So I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. We're going to pray and uh, receive our morning tithe and offering. Again, if you're our guest, fill out one of these green cards. It's called Connect Card. And if you want to communicate anything to us, go ahead and do that here or online. Uh, You can drop it in the offering basket when it comes around, or you can drop it off at the front desk as well as soon as service is over today. So let's let's pray. Father, we want to thank you today uh, for your amazing grace in our lives and that you have touched us in so many different ways. So we thank you. We thank you and we thank you. Continue to give us a heart of gratitude as we follow you for your greatness is overwhelming. In Jesus' name we pray and we say together, amen and amen. 
Hey, a little report. Uh, Annette and Tracy, my wife, and a, another a woman from our church, Tracy, they're hiking for the Freedom Hikers. They're on Sisters right now. They'll be summiting Sisters, South Sisters, probably in the next few hours. And as she said last week when she brought her message, that would be praying for her about this time. And so we threw up a few pictures there. They love to do this. They, they are doing an incredible job. This whole team is raising funds to build safe houses for those that are caught in sex trafficking. The first year they did it was about three years ago. They raised a little under $100,000. This year it looks like they're going to be well over three to $400,000. And so it's really, a good, it's really a good thing, a good cause, just to be able to give people a safe place, um, the most vulnerable in our communities. And we find that God just uh, wants us to be part of the solution. And so that's what she's doing right now. Someone asked me the other day, do you go hike with her? I said, no, 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 no. She's like a Navy SEAL, man. I can't even keep up with her. So uh, I hold down the fort. That's what I do. I do that really well. So let's uh, continue to pray for them. And I think there are uh, 15 or 20 women on South Sisters hiking today. So continue to pray for them. One other thing I'd like to do this morning, I think it's just appropriate. Uh, would you just stand with me just for a moment? I want to do this together with our church community. Uh, there's no better place to be when there's turmoil in our world. It's to, to be with each other and in God's presence. I just want to take just a moment of silence for the families in El Paso, the families in Dayton, Ohio. And just pray for God's peace and God's comfort in Jesus' name. So just a moment of silence if you just bow your heads with me. Father, we pray that your light shines, that your light shines in this nation, your light shines around the world, and that we would be people that would bring your peace and your grace to communities that are hurting, communities that are devastated and torn apart. We just pray for those lives right now. We pray for the survivors of, of, each, uh, of each of the shootings, Lord. We just pray in Jesus' name that you would comfort them, comfort the families that have lost. We pray your great grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Really, thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you for doing that today. Uh, you have your bulletin. If you don't mind, pull your bulletin out today and go to the back, and you're going to find a place where you can keep notes. At the same time, if you multitask, you can open your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're continuing our series, The Hall of Faith 2.0. Uh, many of you wrote in and gave us your favorites. David, the life of David, is one of your favorites. And because his life is so big, it's actually bigger than life itself almost, we're going to take this week and next week, and we're going to study a little bit about the life of David and the kind of giants that he faced. Because we face some of the same things today. We, we, we live in a day and age full of fear, anxiety, discouragement, and God has given us the solution. He's given us the solution through His Holy Spirit and through His eternal Word that's always steadfast and works through all generations. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 is, is a common place for us. I mean, many of you that grew up in church and some of you that, that haven't really had church background would know this story. It's actually one of the most recognizable stories in the Bible. It's the story of David and Goliath. Now, here's what can happen. Let me, let me give you a little caution here. Here's what can happen when we come to those often told stories in the Bible. We, we can miss the lessons. We can miss the opportunities uh, for personal growth in our own lives. And there's a reason why. The reason why is because the story is so familiar, we preempt what God wants to teach us, what he wants to tell us, by responding to him saying, oh, I know, I know. I know what this is about. I, I read this when I was uh, in third grade. I, I know what this is about. Let's do this today. Let's go into this story with an open heart. And instead of saying, I know, I know, uh, let's say, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. Uh, because I just want to learn more about what Jesus has for me and what he has for you. And this is one of those stories that can really help us do that. The story of David and Goliath is so rich with, I think, a prophetic word from God today. We need to hear from God. 
with things that are happening in our own lives, things that are happening in our own nation and around the world. We're in desperate need of a prophetic word. Would you say yes to that? I, I think we are. And I think this is a great place for us to find it. This story speaks really to two of our greatest enemies. And these enemies are, are ravaging and destroying lives. The enemies that I, I'm talking about here are the enemies, first of all, of fear and the enemy of discouragement. There are absolute giants in our society and in our lives today. And so for the next few Sundays, I want to take just a little time and look at how David dealt with these enemies and so asking yourself this question, what are your fears? What are, what are the things that bring anxiety to your life? It might be a struggle in relationship. It might be provision. It, it might be uh, uh, something that's going on at work or at school. There are things there that cause anxiety in our lives. And it's good for us to be honest with those things, to be able to say, Lord, these are the things that bring anxiety. These are the things that, that cause me to fear. And Lord, I want to bring them to you because you're the author and finisher of my faith. And I know this is the proper, right, best place to bring my fears and anxiety, and that's to you. And so we're going to take a little time and recognize a few things. I think you might know this, that fear will cripple you, it'll paralyze you, and it'll make your life miserable and, and, and ruin your future. That, that is the hideous nature of fear running rampant in our lives today. If you take out um, your bulletin, again, on the back, you're going to find a place that you can take notes. And I want you to take notes today, and, and in a few days, just go back to those notes, refer to them, and see how God speaks to you. Not just now, in, in, in this morning's session, but how will God speak to you in, in two days, in three days, in four days, uh, about your life and your relationship with Him. So first, let's do this. Let's look at the four destructive signs of fear. And really, when we look at these destructive signs, it's actually a spiraling effect. And you'll see that. You'll know what I mean when we get into this text. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, there's an entire nation paralyzed by fear except for one young man. So this is the story, of, again, of David and Goliath. And number one, you write this down, fear will cause you to focus on your problems. Fear will always cause you to focus on your problems. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 4 through 10, it says, And a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, he came out Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That's uh, over nine feet tall. And he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of, of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That's about 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. Its iron point weighed 600 shekels. That's 15 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood, and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Or are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he's able to fight and kill me, well, we, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then this Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. So here's something that I think you should know about this story. Things you might not have known when you've read it before. The name Goliath is probably more of a label than it is actually a name. The name Goliath has meaning to it. In fact, in the Hebrew, it was someone who was a sorcerer, someone who was involved in witchcraft. Now, in Babylonian terms, this really what this means is someone who was a, a, a ravaging spirit, someone, a sorcerer of ravaging spirits. That's, that's really what Goliath means, literally means. He's, he's built up this supernatural uh, representation of who he is to everyone else. I mean, that's what he's doing. If you listen to this, you know that he's stepping out and he's causing everyone to shake in their boots, literally shake. And that's just the way I think the, 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 the enemy works in our lives. Now, granted, he is a big man. Uh, there's, there's no question about that. But what was even bigger was the fear that pervaded the camp of Israel because of not only how tall he was and how big he was, but what he was saying and the spirit 
that permeated through his life. He was a sorcerer. That's what uh, historians tell us. That's what we recognize here. We recognize that this just was a bad guy. Now, there were guys that were that big back then. They typically came from a, a lineage of the Anak people. And so they were just huge, huge people. It's most likely that Goliath came from that kind of, of lineage. So Goliath stands in front of them nine to ten feet tall. Imagine that. Now, just for comparison's sake, you have Goliath, a sorcerer of ravaging spirits. David, the word uh, David, the name David means beloved of God. Do you see the contrast already? And I want you to catch the contrast uh, of these two men, uh, a Philistine from Gath. David was from Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. He was a forerunner, a typology in so many ways of Jesus Christ. Jesus was born in the same place that David was, house of bread. And Jesus in his ministry, what does he say he is? He said, I am the bread of life. So you see what's happening here, the the storyline, the narrative that God is putting together here. Goliath was somebody who was nine feet tall. David was the youngest of eight brothers. Goliath was superior in his warfare techniques. David was 16 or 17 years old. He was a shepherd. He really didn't have the experience that Goliath did. Uh, He was armed with 125 pounds or more. No previous battle experience. David had no previous battle experience. And then he goes out. Goliath does with a shield bearer. Uh, What did David go out with? He went out first with a a sling and he picked up a, a few stones. So you can see the contrast. Now, with that put in front of you, if you didn't know any better and you don't know the end of the story, who would you bet on? I mean, who would you really put your money down for? Probably Goliath. I mean, really, from everything that you can see, uh, from anything that makes sense naturally, then you're going to land in Goliath's camp because he just has it all going for him. So what happens here? Uh, he is somebody who is loud, he's somebody who's big, and he's somebody who's scaring the people uh, of Israel. This is a big problem for Saul because he didn't see any really solution. He was focusing on only his problem. And when you focus only on your problems, that leads you to the second step, and that's they expected only defeat. You see, when you focus on your problems, and that's all you focus on, the next step is you only expect defeat. That's the only thing you think about. That's the only thing that, that actually uh, 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 saturates your thinking is that, you know what, um, here's my problem and there's no way out. I expect defeat. So when I focus only on my problems, I expect only defeat. And that's what it says in verse 11 of chapter 17. It says, on hearing the Philistines' words, what happened? Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. You know, their inner life is wrecked because they're expecting defeat. Our inner lives uh, turn into shambles when we expect only defeat. And maybe you've been there in life before. You might be there right now where you know your inner life is just a mess. And the reason it is is because you are only expecting defeat. I mean, it's that Murphy's Law kind of attitude. It's just like whatever's going to go wrong is going to go wrong. That is really the attitude of defeat. And it, and it, it, it tears us up inside. When you're dismayed and terrified, your perspective of God makes all the difference in the world. See, so how big is God to you right now? Is God the creator of the universe? Is God the one who takes care of you personally? Is God the one who's brought victory to your life and that you're walking in victory with him? Or when you see God, you don't see God as big as your problems. Your problems actually look much bigger than God. I know it can feel that way at times. I know when we go through life, it just feels like everything's stacked against us. And the thing that we must remember is God is greater. God is more sovereign. God is sovereign. And he can take care of the things that I face and the troubles that I deal with. See, you you serve a a great God. I I serve a a great God, and I'm so thankful for this. In other words, what's happening here is, is the Israelites are scared to death. And that really leads to the third step here, and that's an attitude of self-protection. How how many know this, that when you have only an attitude of defeat and and you're living a life that's full of fear, you begin to self-protect? 
You don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to put yourself out there. And that's exactly what the children of Israel did. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 23 and 24, it says, As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines, and he shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled. They fled from him in great fear. You know where they went? They went hiding in their tents. So if you can imagine this, there is a valley between both armies. You have the Philistine army to the west. You have the, the Israelites to the east. They're standing on uh, pinnacles or mountains with the valley of Elah below. And they're shouting back and forth. It was a standoff that went on for 40 days. But every time Goliath came out, they would run in fear. They would go hide. They would get into their tents. They had no solution. They were shaking really in their boots. What happens is we self-protect when, when fear fills our life. When, when we're dealing with anxiety, we just don't have the capacity to go out and do the things that God has called us to do. And that's why fear is such an enemy today. I think fear keeps a lot of us in our, let's call it our spiritual, our emotional tent. That we're just hiding out. We hope nobody sees us. We hope nobody really notices us. We really don't. In other words, they stopped living for anything that mattered, including God, the God of Israel. They just stopped living. They should have been caring about. They should have been caring about their future, the future of their country, the future of their families, the future of the people, the faith and values that they stood for, that God had given them uh, uh, hundreds of years before. The, these are the things that they should have been caring about, but they didn't care about those things. They only cared about their own safety. They should have cared deeply because both secular Jewish and Christian historians say this. They say this is one of the most pivotal battles in all of history. This one right here in the Valley of Elah. Imagine that. Between David and Goliath. In fact, one historian says that the battle between David and Goliath was the single most important battle of all time. You ask yourself why. Well, the reason was that Israel was the only nation at that time that had the values and faith that we share today. God-centered, monotheistic. All other cultures were idol worshipers. They were polytheistic, meaning they worshiped many gods. Can you imagine what would have happened if, if the tide would have changed and it would have been the Philistines? We would probably be living different lives today. We could be. But because of this battle, it turned everything and the first three, I think, the first three signs and steps of fear, they lead to reaping the results of fear. So fear takes a toll. Fear wears us out. So what does fear do? First of all, fear limits our potential. We find ourselves in a self-imposed prison. I don't know if you remember the story. After Jesus had died and rose again, he spent some time with his disciples. And at one moment in John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with locked doors or doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. Where do do doors lock from? Do they lock from the inside or the outside? Yeah, they lock from the inside. And that's exactly what these, uh, these disciples had done. They had taken off in fear. They went into their tent. They went into hiding. And they locked the doors from the inside because they were afraid. Uh, I think that might happen to us on occasion where we just can't handle or manage what's coming at us. And so what do we do? We lock the doors of our heart and we determine not to let anyone in. And we say to ourselves, I'll never let that happen to me again. So what happens with fear is fear limits potential. I think fear also extinguishes our joy. It extinguishes our joy and most of the time we'll start thinking when something doesn't go our way, oh, again, it's happening to me. It's the worst case scenario. I don't know if you think that way. I know uh, there are a lot of people that do and there are times that I might be a little on the negative side. Uh, you know, you hear uh, something that goes wrong, like, for instance, with one of my grandkids, they come running over and they're holding their on, arm, and I'm thinking the worst case scenario, they shattered their arm. It's just totally broken. But they come over and they just have a little abrasion or something like that. We usually do that, don't we? We usually go to the worst case scenarios we possibly can. 
And that extinguishes our joy. In Psalm 55, verse 2, David says this. He says, hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught. This is David, the, the very guy here that's going after the giant. He experienced that himself. And then in uh, Proverbs 12, 25, it says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. And I'm going to say this. That, that, that phrase, kind word, cheers it up. Kind word means a word that speaks life. And so you have to have life in you. You have to have the life of Jesus in you to bring a word that actually lifts people up. You know, I pray that every day for my, for my life. That any encounter I have, the words that I might bring or the actions that I may display in public and how I treat other people would be something that brings the resurrected life of Jesus Christ to that individual. Pray over your words. Pray over your actions. Let your words and action bring life, and it just encourages and cheers up the heart. Fear does something else. It undermines success. It it, it does. It undermines success. Fear causes us to sabotage even ourselves. It keeps us from enjoying the fruits of our labor. Fear, again, causes us to hide out. Jesus spoke to that in, in a parable in Matthew chapter 25, verse 25, it's the parable of the talents, and, and he says this, so, and, and one of the servants said this, so I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. What he did is he went right away, and he hid it. He didn't go out and take the risk necessary to see it multiply. That's somebody living in fear. God has given you some amazing talents. He's given you some amazing gifts. And what he expects us to do is to go invest those gifts into other places and other people. Really seeing the kingdom of God expand. Really seeing the kingdom of God expand through your giftedness. Fear keeps us from seeing it multiply. I don't know if you've ever gone through the Gospels and figured out the math of Jesus. Have you ever done that? When Jesus speaks and he starts talking mathematical terms... You'll never hear Jesus talk with, with addition as a formula. Jesus talks always as multiplication being his formula. Pretty interesting. It gives you an in, inside look at what he's expecting from us. That when he gives us something, when he invests something in us, then he's asking us to go and multiply that. Fear keeps us. It undermines our success. But God has a solution. He really does. He has a solution in how we can respond to fear. And, and it's not, listen, it's, this is not the, the power of positive thinking. Anytime you get to these places, people think, well, is this the power of positive thinking? No. There is a, a positive thinker, in fact, in this story. Uh, and it's not David. You know who the positive thinker is? It's Goliath. There's nowhere in the story that Goliath's saying, you know, I, I don't, maybe I shouldn't do this. You know, there's nowhere in the story that you see or hear of Goliath backing up. What Goliath is saying is, I'm going to get you today. I'm going to come after you today. I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air. I'm going to come after you. That, that's, that's positive thinking. So he went into battle expecting the results that he, that, that he claimed he could, he could produce. That's what he did. And so the guy here that's really into the power of positive thinking is Goliath. Listen, there's a difference between, hear this, a difference between positive thinking and positive faith. Big difference. David was a man with positive faith, a man after God's own heart. David faced Goliath and he said, you know, I know I can because I know God can. You see, that's that's the way that we face the trials. That's the way we face the struggles and the anxiety and fear that may come upon us is we say, God, I, I know I can because I know you can. That's positive faith. That's having an outlook that your God is great and your God can overcome your fear. He can overcome our anxiety. So how do you develop positive faith in a God who can do all things? So when facing your fears, I want you to think a few things here. Remember a few things. Number one, when you face your fears, please do this. Remember your purpose. That God has given you a purpose. He's he's called you to something greater than yourself. God has called you to live for something great. He's caused you to live for Him and His kingdom. Can you say amen to that? I mean, that really puts it in perspective. I know for me. 
when I face fear, when I face anxiety, and, and I, I say, God, this is my purpose. This is what you've called me to do. And, and, and no one's changed that. You haven't changed it. This is still my purpose in life. This is what you've asked me to do. There's something that happens when you start to repeat God's phrases to you through Scripture. Does that make sense? God, you've called me. God, you've given me purpose. God, you've set me on a hill as a light that shines. God, you've called me to be salt of the earth. These are the things you've asked me to do, the things you've called me to do. There's purpose in that. 1 Samuel chapter 17, listen to verses 45 through 47. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. See, this incensed David. David was incredibly angry that someone would step up and curse his God. And so he's going to put a stop to this. He's going to step up to this. He's going to stand up to the giant. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. Here's the purpose that David is getting at. Here's where he drives it home. He says, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. There is his purpose. That's what he's committed to. It says, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands today. Wow. Take this. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge you to do this. If you're facing something that just seems to be insurmountable today, take this passage of Scripture, verses 45 through 47, and just recite it through the whole next week. And let's see if it doesn't become your own, because that's exactly what the Holy Spirit's all about. He's about taking what we see in His living Word and making it alive in us, that we are living epistles, that we are the living Word. He's made us alive in Him. His Word is alive in Him. So there, there's only one reason for David to take on Goliath, and this is the one reason, a great commitment to a great God and his cause. That, that is why he's doing what he's doing. When you look at verse 46, it makes all the sense in the world. And if your purpose or cause is anything less than kingdom, if it's anything less than God, it will fade. It won't endure. It won't last. See, David's not stepping up here and he's saying, I'm doing this on my be- for my behalf, on my behalf. I'm doing this so I don't look bad in front of all of Israel. He's not saying that. He's saying, man, this is for the kingdom of God. This is, this is something bigger than myself, bigger than all of you. This is my commitment. This is my, my great purpose. How can I serve others? How can I contribute to see the kingdom of God expand? See, your contribution is really giving what God has given you, as I said earlier, and investing that in the lives, the people, the relationship, the community around you. It's saying, by doing this, I trust that I'm planting seeds, and those seeds will, they will multiply. So I'm never the one who determines whether I'm a seed planter, or I'm a waterer, or I'm a harvester. I'm not the one that determines that. You're not the one that determines that. I'd like to always be the harvester. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, that's a pretty good resume. But there are times, most of the time, I find myself, oh, I'm, I'm watering a seed right now. You know, I I don't know where this is going to come to fruition, but I trust God with this. And I love those stories when you've been in the faith for a while, that you hear somebody come back to you 15 or 20 years later, which happened to me last week, and say say to me, you watered the seed that God put in me, and here's what's going on in my life now. Isn't that amazing? Ran into this guy in Wilco looking for nuts and bolts in Wilco, which they sent the wrong guy to, to do that i'm not the right guy to do that so i'm just staring at the whole all the bins and i'm i don't even know what i'm looking at and there's this guy that's standing right next to me he looks up and he goes hey pastor ron and i said robert man it's so good to see you and the first thing i said was can you help me find my bolts and screws and nuts here and uh you know what he said he, he said um he said i'm so grateful He said, I remember the day you led me to the Lord on the sidewalk over there when our church services were in building number one. And you led me to the Lord and you walked me through some pretty tragic moments in my life. And then they 
They started a family and moved off to Sherwood and haven't seen him in a while. You know what he tells me? He says, I- I'm an elder in my church. I lead small groups. I'm part of the worship team. I'm just thinking, this is incredible. Sometimes when we water, we might not ever see the fruit. But be sure, when you're watering in the name of Jesus, there will be fruit. There is always a good outcome. Always a good outcome. Again, I might not see it, but I trust God to bring it about. Here's something else that you need to do. You need to eliminate negative thinking. Anything that's contrary to the mind of Christ. What does Paul say in Philippians chapter 2? He says, now, put on the mind of Christ. Think this way. Anything that's contrary to the mind of Christ, we want to put aside. So notice what David doesn't do here. I want you to pay attention. It's not only what he does, but it's what he doesn't do. What he doesn't do is he, he, he doesn't announce the size of the problem. He doesn't focus on the, the size of Goliath. He doesn't say, whoa, he is a big old boy. Wow, he's nine feet tall. Someone else wrote that down. That wasn't David altogether. Someone else was given the commentary. David isn't focused on the size of the problem, nor is he focused on the negative thinking of King Saul. There's a conversation he has with King Saul. King Saul doesn't know what he's going to do. He's in this this national crisis, and he doesn't know what he's going to do. And this little boy, this little shepherd shows up and says, Hey, let me fight him. You know, here's when you know you're desperate. (laughs) When you say, okay, (laughs) you know. That's when you know you're desperate because you've run out of all the warriors, all the, all the men of God, all the, all the great fighting men. They, they're not even stepping up. And you've got this little guy with a sling and you're going, okay, all right. Can't lose on this one. I mean, you know. And that's exactly what happens here. So David isn't focused on the negative comments that Saul is making, whether directly or indirectly. There were comments that were flying around that I'm sure, you know, if you... If you <laughs> If you're sensitive to offense, you would have walked out of that tent immediately. But David keeps pressing through because he's not focused on that. He's not in that tent to talk with Saul to be offended. He's there to see something happen. He's there to see his God come through. And then he came through in another area, and this sometimes is the most difficult thing that we have to overcome. And we fight it for most of our lives. And it has to do with the negative thinking of family members. You know, things that you were told when you were three or four or five or six years old by family members or people who, you know, were trusted mentors or teachers, and and, and it just hurts. There's pain there. Just, Just think about what David had to press through here. He's the youngest of his brothers. And in fact, if you flip back to chapter 16, when Samuel showed up and said, hey, where are your sons? And he brings in seven of the eight and purposefully leaves out one, the little one, the youngest one, the small one. Samuel perseveres through the whole thing and says, wait a minute, I don't see the king in this mix. There, is there anyone else? And Jesse, his own father, you know what his own father says? He says, yeah. And he uses, we see it in English, but it's, it's a much more derogatory in Hebrew. He says, yeah, there's the youngest one who's out just tending sheep. I mean, that's the only job we had left. He's out there. The word in Hebrew is actually the word hakaton. Hakaton just means this. You're, uh, you're a little runt. It means this. You're useless. In the Greek, the word useless is translated in the name onismus. Sound familiar? Story of Philemon. The label put on David by his own father and his brothers was that you are a little one, you're a runt, and you're useless. And so here it is. David's fighting through all of this. He's fighting through all of that. And we get to verses 34 through 37, and it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep when a lion... Or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after it, struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it down and I killed it. Can I make a comment here? It's an implication. The implication that you, you, you have here in David recounting the story is this is the first time anyone's hearing this story. And, and the reason you probably could come up with that conclusion is 
If I knew there was someone in the ranks that killed a lion and a bear with his own hands, I would have him in the front of the line to fight Goliath. I would. I think what happened was David did this in the solitude of the fields of Bethlehem. He probably wanted to tell people, and I'm just thinking that God said, shh, 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 shh. You know, there are times God tells you not to repeat anything. He tells you to keep your good deed to yourself. And I think that's what happened here. I think just the way it's written and the way you hear this, it happened this way. And, and God's saying to David in the moment he killed the lion and the bear, just don't say anything, son. Be quiet because there'll be a time that when you make this announcement, it'll be the turning point of the nation of Israel. And it's here that he shares it. He said, hey, Saul, you didn't know my resume, but here it is. No one really does. I didn't tell anybody. I'm just telling you now, this is what has happened. He says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. You See, David's focus is on the living God. David has a history with God as his deliverer. So the question you have to ask yourself when you come to this place in the story is what is my history with God? What is your history with God? Because I know when I face the giants in life, there's this thing that often kicks in, and it's called historical amnesia. It's like I forget everything that God has done. It's like three or four days go by, and I'm, and I'm wondering, is God going to provide? And God's saying, hey, I did this for you before. I have a history of being your deliverer. I have a history of being your provider. I have a history of saving you. And all of us in this room have a history of God saving us. Don't forget that history. What is your history with God? Take some time, recount your story and your journey as God has delivered you. He's brought salvation to your life. He sanctified you through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have an incredible history with God. I want to say this to, to, to everyone in the room. Don't Please don't let others control your inner life with what they say. I, I, know that, I know that there are people that have even passed on. They're not, they're not even around anymore that oftentimes still control how we feel about ourselves. They control our inner life. I want to tell you right now, do not let anyone else control your inner life. That's between you and God. You let God's narrative speak to you. You let God's spirit speak to you. And in that, there's freedom, incredible freedom in Jesus' name. I just want to say that for for freedom's sake today. A mother that's passed, a father that's passed, God loves them, but maybe they're still controlling the way you think about yourself. Maybe they're still controlling the way that you feel about yourself. In Jesus' name, let that be broken today. God has called you beloved. Here's another thing right here. When fear comes your way, a solution is run toward the battle. I I can't stress that enough. I I can't say that. I can't overemphasize this enough. Run toward your battle. Not away from your battle. Run toward your battle. Seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? I mean, this is a this is a Big boy right here. I think I should run the other way. What does David do? (laughs) He says he ran toward Goliath. I love the story. He ran at him. Can you imagine what Goliath thought? His first thought was, what in the world is this kid doing? I mean, he's running at me. He's coming after me. Some of you have heard this story before, but it just just tells it perfectly for me. I was in elementary school, lived in a, a, a neighborhood, I mean, rich with kids. On our street alone, in five or six houses, I think there were 28 kids. You know, just a bunch of kids. We all hang out together about three blocks over, and that was the way I had to go to school and come back from school in elementary. There was a mean, ugly dog. And I remember coming home almost every day, and that dog would be hiding right around the fence, 
and he'd stick his head out and he'd growl at me. It scared me to death. And then he'd come out and he'd run at me, charge me. And it made me change my, my way home. It made me change my course. It made me go down a, another street and over a few fences and take a back alley to get home. More, more of a, a, a covert way of getting home than just walking home with your little lunchbox and everyone sees you and this is the right way to go. I'm running the wrong way. This, this dog sent me out of my way days and days and days. I went the other way. Till one day I'm walking home and I see that dog and it's looking at me and I was just fed up. I thought, you're not going to do this to me again. The dog came out from behind the fence <laughs> and I ran at the dog. I just stared at running the dog. You see the dog going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Things are changing. The dog ran at me. For you pet lovers, please forgive me, but he ran at me, and I punched that dog right in the nose. I hit that old ugly dog, just went, boom, and that dog went, boom, and it took off. And for the rest of the years, I walked home, that dog was right there, I'd look at that dog, and I'd go, ah! And the dog go, ah, 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 just run. With God on your side, you scare the enemy. Run at. Run toward the battle. That's what happens here, verses 41 through 48. It says, Meanwhile, the Philistines, with his shield bearer in front of him, uh, kept coming closer to David. And he looked David over and (laughs) saw that he was just a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. and, And he despised him. And he said to David, Am I a dog that you would come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. And and I'm going to give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. And David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, he says, I'm going to take this to you. I'm going to cut off your head. I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds. I'm going to wipe you out so the whole world knows that my God is the God of the universe. And as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line. He ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Run at what you're afraid of today. Have the courage and strength that Jesus Christ gives us through his life and run at the enemy. Don't don't run away. Now, I want you to see what happens here. I love this. Look at what happens after David took action in verses 50 and 52. After David takes action. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword. In his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. David ran and he stood over him and he took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from the sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran away. Now, I want you to pay attention to the next word. The first word in verse 52 is probably the most important word in this whole, whole story. The next word is then. Then. Then the men of Israel and Judah surge forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Uh, Their dead were strewn along the Shimrami uh, road and the Gath and Ekron. What happens here? This is a turning point. When did the people charge the Philistines? It was after David killed the giant. Let me say, let me say this to you because this is what I think this means. Your life influences others that means when people see you overcome whatever it is whatever fear you're facing whatever hardship whatever addiction whatever it might be when people see you overcome it says and then they see you kill the giant hey we're in now we're in now and there's this effect this ripple effect that your courage has on other people Because they're watching your life. They're watching you overcome. And this is what David does. So put your pebble into play. Sling it. Listen to this. 
put your pebble into play because you will never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. You'll never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. What is it God has you, what is it he has put in your heart? You're not going to possess it if you don't pursue it. And then the last thing, I'm going to finish with this. Remember God is your strength. That's just, you remember that God is your strength. Verse 37 in this, uh, this account, it says, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And so Saul said, go ahead. See, he, he knew that his strength was in the Lord. He knew that, that God had called him for this moment, for such a time as this. And I know there are things that we look at and we face, and with our eyes, it just seems overwhelming. It just seems so difficult. I remember I uh, was in Sri Lanka several years ago, and, and those, those people are believers, man. They just, they just, they, they just believe. Unlike, I, I know I do, and unlike many of us, they just believe because this is the place and the conditions that God has them in. They're war-torn. It was a civil war going on, and there was these huge spiritual conflicts. And, and I was over there to meet with some other leaders and pastors from all over the island of Sri Lanka. And uh, afterwards, they always pray for the sick. And, and I believe God can heal, and I pray for the sick every chance I get. But I'm not the greatest man of faith all the time either. I mean, really. I mean, people, people like maybe think we might be but we're not and so i'm praying for a few folks and it was little small things and i could handle that and and i looked up and standing in line standing in line was a man who was blind with cataracts they just his eyeballs were white and i thought to my here's what i thought to myself oh i hope he doesn't come over my line man i i can hang i, I can do the hang nails you know, I can, I can do a few of those things, but blindness, blindness. I said, but Lord, if he comes and I'm praying for him, and sure enough, out of all the people he could have went to, he stepped up and he stood right in front of me. And it wasn't a, you know, shouting, yelling in Jesus' name kind of thing. I just looked at him and I said, man, God loves you. In Jesus' name, be healed. I witnessed it. All this stuff fell out of his eyes just fell out and he started running around going i can see in tamil that was the language he spoke i can see i can see i can see and i'm going really wow (laughs) whoa that's amazing what did god ask for he just asked for a little seed he just asked for a little morsel he just asked for you to lean in a little bit that's all i could do that's all i had that's what i did i leaned in and this thing happens and right then as this man's being, <laughs> as this blind man is healed, I'm thinking, well, that sure didn't have a lot to do with my strength or faith. But it had everything to do with God's strength. Listen, there are things that are going on in your life right now that it's God's strength that makes the difference. Just lean in a little bit. God is our strength. His death, His resurrection, that's our strength. I love what Isaiah says, and I'll finish with this. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I'll help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Jesus' name. Would you bow your head with me? Thanks for coming. Father, we just want to finish our time together today being reminded that it is really all about your strength. We are weak, you are strong. Lord, we're foolish at times, and you're wise. Lord, we're, we're fearful, but you bring courage. And we ask for all those things that you can give to us that we cannot give to ourselves. So we lean on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Would you go ahead and do that? Before you go today, just want to remind you, next weekend we're going to go into the story a little more. We're going to talk about discouragement, look at it from a different angle also want to invite you back for next weekend. We're going to have some special announcements we're going to be making, and we want you to be part of that. So we'll be doing that next Sunday. And uh, God's good, isn't he? He is so good. So when you leave today, you've been a hearer of the word. Go and be blessed as a doer of the word. If someone wants prayer today, there'll be people around this building that will be glad to pray with you. God bless you. You are dismissed.